so some real major fear went through my mind uh, at the end of that episode. Not because it was like particularly scary or anything, but uh, just because I sort of remembered the last time we got a big cliffhanger, we had to wait another three months to find out what happened next. Uh, so I was just thinking, oh, they're going to do it again. We're going to wait three months to find out what happens uh, with the end of the world. Uh, but no, actually, as it turns out, it's only another two weeks um, until the next episode. Ah, even that seems like too long. First real sort of indication that uh, the show is probably going to come to an end after, you know, a few more episodes. I think there's four episodes uh, left because the title cards at the end of the episode, they make a picture or something and there's four gaps left in the picture or something like that. Uh, so yeah, probably just these four more episodes and then I imagine that'll probably be it. And, uh, you know, in some ways that's uh, kind of sad in a way because obviously you don't want the show to end. But in another way I'm kind of uh, glad because I don't want any show to overstay its welcome. You know, I, I always feel like, you know, no show should be around for more than about five or six seasons, really. You know, I'm glad that it, they're just going to, you know, give us the story they want to give us and then they're going to end it. So it, in many ways... I'm I'm glad about that. Uh, and also, you know, how awesome is this ending going to be? You, you just know it's going to be great. Looking forward to what's going to happen there, but let's talk about this episode first. Uh, so yeah, kind of interesting sort of commentary on the whole sort of idea of, you know, your childhood ending and uh, all that. Uh, how it's uh, kind of a sad thing, you know, losing your innocence and everything, you know, going into high school. I, to be honest, don't really understand that even as a 29-year-old, um, because honestly, you know, I, I did not enjoy my time at school at all. Uh, you know, people kept telling me, oh, you, you know, you'll miss it when it's gone and everything. I don't miss it at all. Honestly, I don't. I, I don't understand teenagers at all. They are not human beings to me. Uh, you know, it's to, my, it's to me, it's like it's not really sort of living a kind of life. It's just this complete battle constantly, you know, with other people, you know, that you're around trying desperately to keep your social status up and having a lot of hard school work um, to do at the same time, you know, probably having to putting up with bullies in a lot of cases and, you know, having to constantly, you know, stay cool and trendy and everything and keep up to date with everything that's, you know, in and everything. I, I, I did not enjoy it at all and I tried to distance myself from it as much as possible and I am so happy I don't have to put up with that anymore. You know, I drive past a school on my way to work every morning and I feel very depressed because I don't enjoy my job at all. But, you know, it does cheer me up every morning when I see that school there and I think, thank God I don't have to put up with that anymore. So, yeah, I don't understand, uh, you know, the whole end of your childhood and everything. But in a way, actually, you know, this episode isn't really about, you know, the end of your childhood. It's actually about entering the more sort of depressing, more, you know, sort of difficult part of your childhood, which is the teenage years, which is basically, you know, what Wendy's scene right there is uh, sort of more about. It's about when you when you stop becoming a preteen and you become a teenager, actually, life does become a lot more difficult. I'm having a difficult time remembering if I ever really sort of felt that way, uh, you know, when I first started... Uh, no high school or secondary school as we call it in this country. You actually start secondary school uh, at 11 in this country. So, you know, the whole becoming a teenager thing isn't nearly as sort of big a thing, I don't think, in this country as it maybe it is over there. Uh, and I don't really remember really sort of missing those years or anything. I think, you know, I don't miss my childhood at all, actually, to be honest, because you're just free to do whatever you want now as an adult. And I, I was always sort of completely and utterly frustrated by not being able to just do my own thing. Uh, as a child, and I, so, no, I, I don't think I miss my childhood at all, but, uh, you know, how cool would it be to watch a show like this as a child, you know, at the same time, I sort of, uh, more of a bond sort of developing now between Dipper and Ford, I really like uh, the look of that, I really like the fact that they have made Ford a completely likeable character, you know, th there's no sort of clear kind of jerkish sort of kind of bad guy uh, in the family, then I think they're probably trying to build up to this idea that, you know, Stan and Ford are going to make up at the end, and perhaps Ford's going to admit that he was in the wrong uh, for the things he says is done and the way he's treated him and everything. So, you know, they they are at the same time trying to make Ford uh, very likeable. Kind of interesting, actually, you've got Stan and Mabel with, with kind of a bond between the two of them, and at the same time Ford and Dipper. And so, I don't know, maybe in the next episode we're going to see a bit of a rift form between, you know, it's going to be Ford and Dipper on one side and Stan and Mabel on the other, who knows. I don't know, end of the world, it doesn't seem like, you know, any kind of family feud is really going to help the situation, so I don't know, that seems kind of unlikely. Uh, we had kind of a full cast uh, actually in this episode, you know, we, we had basically all of them, I mean, I know Zeus and Wendy didn't play particularly large roles and actually Grenda and Candy were only in one scene. Practically a full cast of sort of major characters, I think Pacifica was the only one, only noticeable absence really. Uh, so obviously Bill comes back, I guessed straight away when Blendon showed up, uh, that has to be Bill I think, you know, it's, especially as soon as he asked her for the rift, because obviously, you know, we heard... Bill said he was going to go off and find a new body somewhere around Gravity Falls, you know, to possess. 
And I thought actually that was going to be quite a big thing, you know, a big sort of twist as to who it was, because the big assumption would have been that it was Gideon. And I thought actually maybe it was going to be either Wendy or Pacifica. And then after Bill had sort of used them, there was going to be this whole dilemma of, first of all, stopping Bill, but also saving whoever he possessed, really. But that seemed to have kind of been forgotten about. You know, it's made very unclear. Um, did Blendon die? Or, you know, is, is there something sort of wrong with him? Or is he just going to come back in the next episode and he's, he's going to help them out with, you know, with whatever happens next, I wonder. It was very unclear. I'm guessing he's not dead, because I don't think they would kill somebody off uh, in a show like this. Uh, and obviously the possessing of Blendon, it did fit with uh, the fact that he was able to trick Mabel there. I was kind of hoping there might be a bit more sort of to it, maybe, that, uh, you know, maybe if it, he was going to fool Dipper by possessing either Wendy or Pacifica, perhaps. That might have been a kind of more interesting, but it ends up it just being a sort of quick throwaway scene. So I was a little disappointed that that maybe wasn't a bigger thing after they set it up in a previous episode like that. Reference to High, High School Musical, which is a Disney film, and this is a Disney show, so they're making fun of Disney films uh, in the show, and I, I kind of like that, you know, sort of admitting the fact that that's nothing like what high school is actually like. That was uh, kind of cool. That spaceship was awesome. You know, that whole sequence of them flying around. You don't see many sort of big drawn-out action scenes in this show actually very much, but uh, that was a really good one. I, I really enjoyed the sort of flying around whole thing, and uh, quite a clever twist at the end with the fact that, you know, Dipper not fearing the spaceship is basically what defeated it. Yeah. It was really, I'm not quite sure what the word to use is, actually. It was uh, really, really clever. I don't know. I, I think I maybe should, I should be using a better word for it than that. But, uh, yeah, that that spaceship flying around scene, that was really awesome. And, and I assume that that bridge that we saw is the same one that we saw in the finale for season one. You know, where they fight uh, that big Gideon robot. So, you know, kind of the big epic battles obviously happen in that area of Gravity Falls. Yeah, much the most interesting thing about this episode for me, uh, even though it, obviously it's a really important episode in terms of the whole sort of narrative of the show, much the most interesting part for me was the bit with Wendy, you know, just talking about how fucking awful high school is. And it, it's so true, it's so absolutely true. High school is the worst. It, nobody treats you like a human being. They're, they're all... It's, it was a bit just some big every man for themselves fighting their to maintain their social status, and if it has to be at somebody else's expense, so be it. That's basically the way it works. And then suddenly, once you leave high school, or secondary school as it is in this country, suddenly you become a decent human being again. You know? And I, I didn't realise that that was what was going to happen when I left school as well. So for a long time after I left school and I went into these sort of basically these training jobs and training services and everything, I just assumed it was going to be like high school again, so I just kept very quiet for a long time. And then people actually came and started talking to me like a normal person, and I'm like... Huh? What's this? So that it's so weird, high school. The, the way people are just not human beings at all. It's, it's unbelievable how miserable a life it is. And I hope I'm not just uh, speaking as like a, an isolated, exclusive experience that you know was just you know unique to me. Or else I'm gonna be so fucking annoyed if, if it turns out a lot of people are just sort of saying in the comments, "Oh, it wasn't like that for me." No, no. It, I, I think you just went to a bad school or something. I am getting so off topic here. I'm not talking about the episode enough, really. Um, yeah, disappointed, actually, that there wasn't any appearance from Pacific here. You know, obviously, if there is any kind of romance, maybe is going to form between Dipper and her. Perhaps the fate of the world isn't perhaps the best episode to bring it into, but, uh, you know, I, I thought it might be kind of interesting maybe to sort of feed into that and set that up maybe for a later episode, just to maybe have her show up and have them maybe be there, maybe ready to sort of fight Bill in whatever he's, it is he's planning to do here in the uh, sort of end of the world type battle, I have really have no idea here, because Ford does basically say it's the end of the world, it's not like even sort of set, it's not like um, that four part story at the end of a season of Teen Titans where the devil shows up, you know, basically he's sort of like, oh I'm really here to sort of take over the world, and then it's in the next episode you see it is literally the end of the world, but they keep on fighting him, you know, uh, in that sort of otherworldly kind of state really that does basically look like hell, so here they, they're kind of almost setting up like it's almost going to be the same thing again uh, here because they actually have Fort say it is the end of the world. So I don't know if maybe Bill is going to transport them to some kind of hell type area where the whole sort of battling is going to take place or if maybe perhaps Ford's overshot things a little bit and perhaps Bill needs something to sort of properly take over the world or something or end the world or whatever it is he's planning to do, you know, honestly. I watched this show, you know, I've watched this episode uh, about three times now, trying to sort of second guess exactly what it is Bill's planning to do here and what uh, the little group are going to try and do to try and stop him. And I honestly have no idea what it is because there's really no sort of clue as to exactly what's going to happen here. And uh, 
that's intriguing. I really like that. I cannot wait to see uh, what's going to happen here. I mean, I'm guessing it's not actually going to be the end of the world and things are going to work out, but you don't know how it's going to happen. And very kind of interesting the way that things sort of very quickly, you know, go go downhill sort of quite subtly, because there's quite a light-hearted and quite a relaxed kind of nice nature to the opening of the episode with them planning their 13th birthday. And as things go on, things get sort of more sort of mundanely depressing. I think maybe it's the term to use there. It's kind of depressing in more a kind of innocent kind of less traumatic kind of way of just in you know, Mabel's thinking, oh, I don't want this to sort of happen. And it's kind of the old message you see in a lot of kids' shows about, oh, you need to accept change. You know, things can't remain the same forever. Uh, and then just suddenly things really get completely fucked up uh, right near the end. I have noticed one sort of major criticism of this episode is that uh, Ford, Dipper and Mabel are all re really dumb in this episode. You know, all all sort of combined, they do really sort of dumb things of Dipper and Forth in a way, maybe not having more respect for Mabel's feelings, and the fact that Mabel does just sort of hand the rift to Blendon without a second thought about, you know, what it is that she's doing, since, you know, she doesn't actually know what that rift is. To me, though, the fact that she doesn't know what it is, uh, it makes a lot more sense why that she would give it to Blendon. If she knew what it is, there's no way she would give it to Blendon, or Bill, as it actually turned out to be, of course. So to me, the only way in which you can get Mabel to give that rift thing to Blendon is uh, if she doesn't know what it is. Now, you may be sort of asking, well, if she doesn't know what it is, then why would she give it to him? Would she not maybe think, occur to her that this could be something dangerous? Well, she doesn't know that it's Bill. She, she, she thinks that it's Blendon, you know, Blendon's somebody that they've helped out in the past. You know, she has no reason not, not to trust him. He, if he's asking for this rift thing, he presumably knows what it is, and he knows, you know, what to do with it, and presumably won't do anything dangerous with it, because, she do again, she doesn't know it's Bill. So to me, no, it, it's not so much uh, stupid of Mabel to hand over the rift to someone that, you know, she felt that she could trust. It's more maybe just a sort of a little naive, and she is kind of upset at this particular point, and perhaps, you know, a, li a little bit traumatised and not sort of properly sort of thinking straight about, you know, what she's doing. So, to me, no... It's a little dim of Mabel, but it's kind of forgivable given the situation. I thought the whole thing with the walkie-talkies and Mabel overhearing the conversation, that's a little bit of a cliche that you have seen a lot in the past. It, it seems very unrealistic to me. I can't imagine anything like that sort of actually happening in real life, you know, the way that they just sort of overhear a conversation and, you know, sometimes it's a case of misunderstanding what they mean. In this case, it wasn't a misunderstanding. It was what Mabel heard was exactly how it was. But to me, that that's still a little bit of a cliche, sort of just sort of overhearing something and, you know, getting upset about it, you know, purely for that reason rather than, you know, confronting the person. Although she does confront Dipper uh, later on and ask him about it, but it doesn't actually seem like she was really all that interested in listening to what he had to say. But again, I, I suppose Dipper didn't really deal with it particularly well. But I still like the fact that, you know, it's still very much at the forefront of Dipper's mind that, uh, you know, he has to, to keep in mind how Mabel's going to think about everything that he does, you know, because they've been together this whole time. And I suppose the episode uh, Summerween from last season was kind of uh, sort of setting this whole thing up. So I like that. They're bringing back, you know, an issue from a season one episode. So, yeah, they obviously uh, have this whole thing planned out, you know, from the very beginning. Yeah, I think that's about it. I think that's everything I wanted to say. Cannot wait to see what happens next. Thankfully, we only have to wait two weeks. And, uh, you yeah, know, pro probably going to be a very kind of action-y kind of episode, this next one. So, yeah, I look forward to that. So that's that, guys. I will see you guys in two weeks. See ya.